Now on to our panel entitled Securing Cybersecurity. It seems as if cyber attacks are a daily occurrence. As Anna had mentioned in the beginning, uh, the Conti ransomware attack in Costa Rica is just one of many that seems to happen every single day, and it seems like no nation is safe. What can countries do to work together to boost their cyber capabilities and protect their people and systems from nefarious cyber attacks? Well, our moderator today is FIU's very own Randy Pestana, who is the Associate Director and Head of our Cyber Program. Randy, welcome. Thank you, Leland. Thank you, Leland. And I do invite uh, our other panelists to join me on stage uh, as we begin this discussion. Can you all hear me? Good. Can you all hear me? Yes. Love it. I have to use the Marine voice. Uh, for this one. Very excited to be here. Please, if you can be seated. Uh, excited to be here for this fantastic discussion on looking at threats uh, in cyberspace impacting Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, before we kick off, I want to recognize the Perry Center uh, for the great partnership and putting this panel together. So, Boris, thank you so much. Uh, Paul Angelo, unfortunately, he's not here. I know Pat and Aaron, you're there in the room, uh, are here. So, thank you all from the Perry Center uh, for supporting this great panel. Uh, so today I've asked all of our speakers to speak for approximately five to seven minutes uh, worth of remarks. We'll then have a discussion. I know we have about 150 uh, people or so online, so we're definitely going to go to Q&A for our online forum. Uh, but I'm going to introduce first our speakers in the order in which they will speak. First, right next to me, uh, old colleague, Dr. Boris Saavedra, who is a professor at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, more than 30 years uh, of professional service, both here in the United States uh, and Venezuela, uh, and specializes in all security matters in the region, but especially uh, cybersecurity and the future technologies. Sitting next to Boris, uh, shares the record with Tony Long for longest way to get here from London, <laughs> right? Uh, Luis Marie Hurel, who's a research fellow on the cyber team at the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI. Um, and her research uh, interests include incident response, cyber capacity building, cyber diplomacy, uh, very well known in the international cybersecurity community and the founder of the Latin America Cyber Network, a fantastic organization putting together knowledge based on cybersecurity in the region. Sitting next, joining us from Toronto, Mr. Kendrick Bagnall, who is Vice President and CISO for the Cybersecurity Global Alliance and Heather Cybercrime Task Force. Uh, he's also Detective Constabler with the Toronto Police Service where he serves as a cybercrime investigator. Uh, and prior to that, spent over 20 years in IT industry, primarily in the financial services sector. So Kendrick, thank you for being here. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Marty Tre uh, Trevino, who's a cognitive neuroscientist and cyber risk expert, uh, specializing in next generation analytics and artificial intelligence. Uh, he's currently contracted with a number of governments and corporations in Silicon Valley, uh, and spent over 20 years uh, at NSA. Uh, so appreciate you joining us. So uh, I've asked again, our speakers, five to seven minutes. I will be strict with that five to seven minutes because uh, <laughs> we can go on this topic for a long time. But I've asked them to answer this broad question. From your purview, what are the most critical cyber threats facing Latin America and the Caribbean? And how do these threats impact both national security, but also regional security? So Dr. Saavedra, I'll go for you. Okay. Uh, thank you and good morning to everyone. Let me keep in the five minutes. Okay, we are in the fourth industrial revolution today, uh, which means it's potential, accelerated, and converging technology. That means that this technology doubles in power and reduces in price on a regular basis. Gordon Moore, a well known Classic example in 1965, the hyperbic transistor on the integrated circuit had doubled every 18 months. That happened during 50 years. In the simple term, new computers to design new computers made the life faster and, um, and quickly, accelerated and a more uh, precise. Uh, and we call this the law of accelerating performance by Kurzweil. A combination of usage, uh, regulation, growing threat, defining the cybersecurity digital technology 
landscape. Uh, for that reason, the perspective of next 10 years is from the point of view of policy and strategy is it we are generating fast changes that disrupt the landscape of uh, technology. For example, the convergence of artificial intelligence and machine learning in social media, uh, convergence of artificial intelligence with 5Gs, uh, convergence, future convergence of what is going to be the web 3.0, with mean virtual reality, augmented reality, and blockchain, and conversion of quantum computer with artificial intelligence. This taken together is a major concern, challenge, and opportunity in Latin America and the Caribbean. Why? First, artificial intelligence is that technology that allow emulating human tasks through learning and automation. But this artificial intelligence we live in today is just in a specific task. It's not general artificial intelligence. These are, these, um, are hectic days of fifth generation communication. What that mean? Faster communication, low latency, and tremendous volume of data. And third, the future web 3.0 is based on convergence of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, <coughs> remember the, the Y web 1.0, it was about reading only. The web, web 0.2 that we use in today is more now about reading and write like a Gmails and Google document, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. But the idea of the web, future web 3.0 is decentralized ownership and control by putting the web in the hand of the users and the community. Technology convergence of quantum computer of artificial intelligence. The debate on quantum computers do not question if this type of devices uh, become fully operational, but when is going to happen? Uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, perspective in the framework of converging accelerated as potential technology bring a lot of questions. The protection of critical infrastructure and the regulation of social media in the areas of main uh, focus in Latin America and the Caribbean today. Major vulnerabilities in the area, lack of legal framework, policy, and strategy for cybersecurity. Second, lack of political will to address cybersecurity as major priorities, national level, regional, and international level. And third, lack of material, personal, financial resources to address cybersecurity. What need to be done in Latin America and the Caribbean for the critical infrastructure protection? We need to have a legal framework to design policy, implement a strategy to identify, organize, categorize, and prioritize critical infrastructure. <clears throat> for the use of social media, network, legal framework, policy, and strategy to control under the rule of law, cyberspace, uh, but also in the principle and values of liberal democracy. That's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Boris, appreciate that. Uh, Luis. <laughs> Thank you very much, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, um, when you said, you know, what are the critical, most critical cyber threats, right? I, I want to take a step back because I think there are different natures of threats that kind of come together. So I'll, I'll touch on like more cybersecurity related ones and kind of like, let's say more structural challenges that we need to face and look 
at cybersecurity through those lenses, right? So um, when thinking about these threats, right, I mean, in the first category that's more specifically related to, to, let's say, cyber threats, I think there are particularly three challenges that we can see in the region. Well, the first of them is definitely the question of ransomware, right? Um, I think we've seen with, with different, um, let's say, notorious incidents, um, such as, you know, uh, WannaCry, you know, we can talk about the older ones. Um, but what we see now is that there is this trend towards, you know, countries in the global south facing really, really uh, crippling effects of ransomware incidents. And that's the case, for example, with Conti uh, in Costa Rica. I think that was the most notorious case in Latin America. And it's quite interesting because it almost placed Latin America again in the map of, let's say, the, the international discussions uh, when it comes to uh, cybersecurity, where, you know, Costa Rica, nine of um, nine government ministries were deeply affected by that. It was the first country to actually declare a state of emergency because of a cyber attack, which is an interesting precedent coming from the region, right? And we could talk about later on, you know, what kinds of precedents can come from developing countries facing these attacks. You know, uh, in Albania's case, I don't want to talk about other regions, but like in Albania's case, it was also the first time that, you know, diplomatic ties were cut because of a cyber incident, right? So we need to pay attention to, let's say, developing economies and what does that mean in terms of uh, escalation. Um, you know, many Russian based groups also operating when it comes to with financial interest and economic kind of interest, uh, exploring different, uh, let's say, sectors in, in Latin America. Um, and in December, for example, uh, Colombia was heavily hit, like one of the companies that provides health services in Colombia was heavily hit by a ransomware, uh, which is called Keralti, and, um, and, and that actually kind of led people, you know, everyday, you know, citizens to not have, have access or proper access to healthcare services. Um, so it does show the disproportionate effect of ransomware also, and particularly in context of developing countries in the region. Uh, the second one is not a new one, right? I mean, we know that there are lots of, you know, financially motivated, let's say, criminal organizations operating in Latin America. And, and one of the, you know, in the cybersecurity area, you know, banking Trojans are particularly interesting and they have been kind of a continuous trend. Uh, we can think about like the notorious incident in Mexico in 2018, where the systems of pavements over there were actually taken down and it resulted on a loss of $15 million uh, because of that incident. Um, the third element is commercial hacking tools. Um, we've seen like just yesterday, there was another report from Amnesty International and Citizen Lab saying that a uh, Dominican Republic reporter um, covering the government and, and transparent accountability with regards to the government, she was targeted by the use of Pegasus uh, spyware, right? So that is yet another, let's say, chapter of also the Dominican Republic using it. Other countries in Latin America have used it as well. So you have the case of... Um, of um, Mexico using it as well. So it's not some, and Paraguay as well. So I think, and El Salvador, sorry, I'm remembering while I'm speaking. So you see that there's a range of interest from the countries in the region of actually using those kinds of surveillance technologies. That's not new as well. I think Pegasus did get the attention, but in 2014, countries in Latin America were already buying uh, from um, uh, another group called, um, hacking team, other tools to also, you know, uh, infiltrate and actually spy on the citizens. And it's actually even more concerning when we look at this panorama within our region, uh, because that also provides, you know, an understanding that the threat is actually inside. It's not necessarily an external threat. So this notion of, let's say, having to surveil citizens is something that's particularly concerning. And just a bonus, I think, you know, we, we look at the great power politics of cybersecurity. We see a lot of mentions with regards to, let's say, Iran or the usual suspects, right? Russia, China as least key threat actors. Let's attribute, I think that's a, a thing that the UK and other allies and the US have been trying to do. Uh, but we should note as well that, you know, these groups, these APTs, these advanced persistent threat state sponsored cyber uh, groups, they are also operating in the region. So you have cases being reported of Chinese hacker groups um, actually targeting governments in Latin America and trying to actually um, uh, exfiltrate data um, and among others, right? I mean, I already mentioned the, the Russian ones. But as I said, this is 
you know, this in itself is very interesting, I think, but I think as a person that has been in cybersecurity for quite some time, I just feel we always think that cybersecurity is actually quite special, uh, but we need to position that within the broader landscape, right, which I think also um, touches upon a couple of the points that were mentioned previously. And I think, you know, it's impossible to think about cybersecurity in the Black region if we're not thinking necessarily about these structure factors, such as the existence of legacy systems. So, you know, there are contracting agreements that have, you know, many countries in the region are tied to particular systems operating that are quite outdated. And that provides like just already like this structural gap in terms of actually having, you know, which kinds of systems and actually having, you know, cybersecurity as something that's baked into. So that creates even a greater challenge for countries in Latin America and potentially in other developing regions uh, to actually, you know, be accountable and advance in actually protecting their government systems because they have these contracts for, I don't know how many years of having that particular kind of software. So that is one thing that we need to, to think about, you know, there's this uh, very interesting worm that uh, was called Conficker worm. It spread in the early 2000s, so it was 2008, 2009. It's a vulnerability that should have been like patched uh, or solved for many years now, but a report from 2021 actually said that this vulnerability still exists and more than 150,000 um, computers were, were detected with that vulnerability. And guess where those countries are based? I mean, lots of them based in Latin America and Southeast Asia, uh, which again is just to illustrate how something that was a critical vulnerability in 2009, it hasn't gone away. It's still there and it's mostly in countries in the global south. Um, and again, you know, the second point on the structural challenges, I think, you know, it goes back to the point that was raised previously on the lack of high level visibility of the cybersecurity agenda in the region. I think there are really great efforts at the OAS to push that conversation forward. Countries in the region have been developing norms for responsible state behavior and confidence building measures at the regional level through the CBMs, the Confidence Building Measures Working Group at the OAS. And there are other dialogues but they are not high level political dialogues. And I guess the question here is what will trigger countries in the region to actually have a concerted conversation about cybersecurity as a political priority more than let's say a niche area, right? If you see that this is a critical element for development in the region, right? That you cannot think about development without thinking about cybersecurity why is it so that is in spite of like Conti in Costa Rica, uh, Brazil having their uh, superior electoral, uh, superior uh, justice uh, system being coming offline in 2021 and being labeled as like the most critical incident in the public sector ever in history, in Brazil's history. I mean, in spite of these continuous reports, why is it that we don't see that kind of priority? And I'll, I'll stop in just a second because I think that touches upon questions of regional integration that we can dive a little bit deeper on why also um, the challenges around regional integration that we're seeing now, you know, Brazil trying to be more active in the global stage, but at the same time, you know, there are various challenges to thinking about how, how these countries meet and think about cooperation in between themselves more than necessarily just thinking about that external, like international cooperation, but we can talk more about that later. Thanks so much, Luis. Kendrick. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, a quick thank you to the Canadian government, Global Affairs Canada, uh, the Council General here in Miami and my leadership at the Cybersecurity Global Alliance for making me making it possible for me to be here on very short notice. Uh, I just found out uh, late last week and next thing I knew a plane ticket was booked and I was here. So I'll keep my comments brief, but I will frame them around a quote that I, I use quite often. And if you've ever received an email from me from my day job, you would you'd read it in the signature. And it says that Cybersecurity is not a technology problem. It is a human condition that will force all of us to work together collectively and collaboratively at the pace of the adversary just to stay in the game. I think there's a strong misconception that cybersecurity is an IT problem. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, whether it's doing risk assessments or tabletop exercises, where when the question is asked, you know, in the wake of a breach, who do you call? And everyone is thinking, well, they call the IT department, they call the IT person. There's this strong misconception that 
whoever does the day-to-day -day care and feeding of the technology that, that house the data and, and provides access via the applications are the ones to call in the wake of a breach. And that's a total misconception because cyber in itself is far more uh, intricate and far more complex than that. That said, to find solutions, it being a human uh, condition, it really has to be policy driven. And for it to be policy driven, there needs to be, and again, I probably echo some of my colleagues' previous comments, there needs to be political stability because this needs to be driven policy from the top down. And that needs to really drive education and awareness. And education from the standpoint of the technical expertise that's required to meet the cybersecurity challenge, the ongoing and growing cybersecurity challenge, I think the stat is there are about 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs across the US uh, today. And how are we gonna, how's that problem going to be fixed? Well, it's going to come through education and awareness training. Now, the awareness side applies to the end user. If you, depending on your source, 65 to 70% of breaches are being caused because of human error. They're being caused uh, through targeted phishing, through social, uh, social media campaigns, through highly sophisticated uh, social engineering campaigns. So there really needs to be that sense of awareness. The other part of the problem too is that there's the misconception that not only is cyber a technology problem, but there's some sort of end game. If you can put together some sort of incident re response and recovery plan for me and I sign on the dotted line, I'm done. That's far from the case. We're working in a space where there's innovation happening at an extremely rapid pace. And because of that, it's more of a cyclical effect where you can have the education, you can have the awareness, you can have the training, you can prepare the incident response, you can have a solid uh, playbook, but then the technology changes, the techniques and tools of the adversary change, and now you're starting at the beginning again. So you never actually get there, even in terms of awareness and reducing that 65, 70%, it will likely, in, in all likelihood, it will never get to zero. But it's when you're, you know, if you've ever taken calculus, you know, you get to zero, you try to get to zero, but you'll never actually get there. You keep cutting that number in half. Uh, in terms of applicability to the region, uh, you have a lot of vulnerability in terms of political instability. Uh, you have the lack of policy. Uh, you have the lack of awareness from a general citizen perspective. And albeit there's a lot of uh, dated technology and technology infrastructure there, uh, those things can be fixed because again, uh, that's just the infrastructure. The more complex part is really getting the policy and figuring out how to derive really good cybersecurity policies to protect industry. Uh, the last point I'll make quickly in terms of breaches, there's been a lot of talk about Conti uh, I've been privileged to be part of a Europol run group for a, almost a year and a half now investigating Conti. Last year in the wake of the Conti leaks, the group has disbanded. Uh, there are multiple strains and variants now of ransomware that are out there. Uh, we think ransomware is a problem now. I really believe we're seeing the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And in a region where you have so much um, vulnerability in terms of natural disaster, we now look at a problem where it's what I call next level cyber in terms of a breach of financial data that gets monetized. At the end of the day, no one gets as much as a paper cut. But when we talk about next level cyber, we talk about threats to critical infrastructure. And we talk about a very vulnerable region that are vulnerable to natural disasters. Now you're talking about potential susceptibility to the power grid water purification and all of these other things. And you now have an exponentially mounting problem. So this is something that needs to be fixed sooner than later. Uh, these conferences are great, but without tangible takeaways and actionable takeaways where each and every one of you can go back to your organizations, talk to your leadership and take, some, take at least one point and say, we need to work on this. We need to address this. We're never gonna get there. Um, so I believe it really comes down to collaboration, coordinated efforts at the pace of the adversary, because believe me, I have seen it in the last year, eight years investigating cyber. This is the adversary's full-time job. This is how they buy their groceries. This is how they pay their rent. And they just have to get lucky once. And when you're working in cyber and when you're working in information security, you have to be hypervigilant. You have to get it right all the time. 
And we have to not only protect against the cyber threats when it comes to data loss, we really have to protect the cyber threats when it comes to the threats to critical infrastructure, because that, I believe, in my opinion, is going to be what, what would be most damaging to the region. Fantastic. Thank you, Kendrick. Marty. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for everyone for being here. And I want to thank my, uh, my, my two cohorts in front of me who spoke because they both opened up the human factor, if you will, which uh, that, that, that tends to be my specialty. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with, uh, with a provocative statement that our success in cybersecurity, especially within the region, but globally, depends on one, it partially on one ill understood concept data-driven, human-centric decision-making, okay? And let me repeat that, that's really deep. Our success in part depends on our ability to inform mental models and decision-making at the individual human level from a cognitive neuroscience perspective. And, and, and let me explain that for, for a second. Um, what capabilities we, we fund, what uh, human skills, we, we develop what technology we select and purchase, even how we conceptualize very complex problems uh, such as supply chain, right? A very, very complex problem. All, all depends at the highest level on one thing, how human beings interrogate, synthesize, process uh, data for decision-making and understanding. And understanding is a very deep, deep word, okay? Um, there are a couple of problems with doing this, uh, and these problems are magnified uh, in, in the region, but they, but they extend in every corporation and every organization, every government, anywhere on the planet. And, and that, that is that um, the human brain, in the way that it processes information and makes decisions with data, is not, is not usually what we think. In fact, one could say, we don't, we make emotional, we make decisions based on emotional responses from data. And that's because of the way that the human brain is structured. Um, so today on the cutting edge of next generation analytics and artificial intelligence is the human factor that, that, um, that we are now trying to look from the inside out from a cognitive neuroscience perspective outward and say, how exactly does the human brain make decisions with data so then we can structure we can structure all the, the four elements to that, you know, structure the data properly, create the user interfaces, uh, the, the analytics, uh, you know, everything to create higher degrees of resonance and in fact, make better decisions around what are high risk, ill-structured um, problem sets that, re that require uh, high degrees of complex reasoning. Well, and again, it gets very complicated, but these type of decisions that we make as senior leaders in cybersecurity differ greatly from many other decision types that are made out in the world. Um, and there has been a great failing in this uh, it, through, throughout the, 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 the cybersecurity industry. Um, one could even say that, that, that the entire problem set, it, it is a failed problem set. We have failed as, as scientists and data scientists and researchers to inform in a data-driven way, decision-making at the highest level, which is the most important, okay? What, what capabilities do, do we develop? How do we structure policy? What technologies do we purchase? How do we conceptualize, quantify a, a, a supply chain problem? Very complex, very ill-structured, lots of reasoning required. And what you find um, is, scientifically we've discovered that the human brain resists data at those type of decision levels. If we're looking to, to act, on, act on a breach and, and the data is very simple, uh, you know, it's like ordering paper in an office, you're looking at it and you in react instantly. But when you get to the highest levels, okay, and you say, we need, to, we need to formulate policy around this. We need to figure out technology purchases, okay? Human beings resist data and the brain functions in a fundamentally different way. And, and you don't need a PhD in this, okay? Everybody here has been in a meeting at some point when, when let's say technology was being purchased, right? The gentleman gets it. Um, um, and all the data is presented and the specs are presented and you've got the spec sheets and the, the, the companies are doing the presentations and one is obviously faster, one catches more, but you know, sometimes a, a, a clear winner comes out 
And this new iteration of technology by any one of the companies, just all the stats and everything's better. And that senior leader says, yeah, but I trust this company's technology. And we're going to go with who I trust because I've learned to trust my gut. That's the manifestation of this very complex interaction in the human brain of, of analysis with data versus, versus decision making. We could get really complex later, but but and the you know, and we see that in all types of decisions. So when we talk about the human factor uh, uh, to this, I go from the inside out and say, um, we have made a, a mistake in data science. We approached, we approached a human-centric decision-making challenge, okay, at the highest levels, and we approached it wrong. We approached it from the data, from the math, from the method, from the visualization, and we presented all these beautifully designed systems and interfaces, and we at no point thought how the human brain actually makes decisions with data. So one of the great challenges for Latin America and the whole region is, um, you know, taking this, taking this, um, this, in, this, this, this pyramid, if you will, right, where uh, a gentleman earlier said, you know, only at the top do they have the highest level understanding, and we have to somehow flip that around um, to 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 where to where understanding and data driven decision making. Uh, it permeates throughout the organization. And we're not gonna do that by doing it the way we've done it for the last 20 years. So on the cutting edge of technology today, we're bringing in cognitive neuroscience to understand how human beings make decisions and designing data sets, systems, information, whether it's contextual or core, and how, how human beings explore data hierarchically, horizontally, core, contextual, right? And 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 helping to design next generation next generation analytics and AI so that we can address the human factor that is so critical and in fact reduce decision errors and 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 I, and I love what what the lady said you know how do we turn this from um, how do we turn this into into a priority conversation versus versus a, a niche conversation well that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen doing what we've been doing for 20 years. We've got to take a slightly different approach to that. And part of that approach is an inside out. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Great comments all the way across. So thank you all for that. Uh, for the audience, we're going to do this a little bit different. So if you want to start pulling up to ask some questions, we're welcome to do that. For those of you that are tuning in, I know we have about 150 or so uh, folks online. Uh, feel free to type in your question. We'll get those questions uh, taken over to me and we'll ask uh, our panelists. One thing that was fascinating with all the responses was the different areas of responsibility, right? And I don't think we got a clear picture as to where the responsibility lies. And I think part of that is because of the perspective of, of if I'm a policymaker, it res resides in my IT division. If I am a citizen, it's responsible for by my government. If I'm a government, it might be responsible by the international community, which is impacting more than just my individual country. It's impacting the region, right? So where does the responsibility lie in terms of protection? And, and going to the point, where is that emotional trigger that forces action to occur? If Costa Rica wasn't it, right? Costa Rica is arguably the worst case in the region. If Costa Rica wasn't it, if Guacamaya wasn't it, what is that emotional trigger that will get the population on board that in the context of representative democracies, I now demand my policymaker make a change. So Luis, if I can start with you on that question. Yeah, um, I, I wonder how much uh, of, I still wonder how much Conti and Guacamaya is actually kind of play into the, let's say the imaginary of the population with regards to risks. I don't think particularly as well that, um, you know, more reporting around leaks um, will necessarily also kind of make the imaginary of the population in these countries actually think that cybersecurity is a priority. And that is why I think ransomware is definitely something that kind of like it, it stops people's access um, to, to let's say particular services. So, I mean, that's, that's just a point, the first point to what you said, but I, I definitely, you know, I definitely agree that there's a lack of prioritization in the region. And when it comes to thinking about where the responsibility lies, I think governments 
are slowly trying to step in and say, you know, there's something that we need to do. Um, and we talked about all the problems, but I think there's some some elements that are positive. So one element that's positive is like Costa, um, Costa Rica, Chile, Colombia, and Brazil have been trying to pass uh, legislations, and mostly since last year, on uh, specifically on cybersecurity, right? Many of them have developed their national cybersecurity strategies. Uh, but for example, Chile just last week approved their uh, cybersecurity law that has its cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. And the key element of most of these, even though Costa Rica didn't pass and Colombia is also still under discussion and Brazil still needs to see if it's actually gonna happen or not. Um, but, but either way, all the discussions revolve around structuring a governance model for these countries. And at the center of the discussion more recently is the establishment of a national cybersecurity agency, um, which then leads to the question, you know, how these responsibility will be encoded yeah. in those kinds of contexts, right? To respond to which kinds of issues. So Brazil has a, a critical infrastructure security strategy. What does that mean in practice? There's lots of gaps in terms of actually going from strategy to implementation. So, I mean, that's my first point on, let's say, where the responsibility lies. I think the state um, should be very much responsible and signal that. Um, I think your point on, you know, oh, it should be top down reminded me when you go, like when you like advising, you know, private companies, you say, look, oh, it's a top down decision. You know, you need to go to CISOs and you need to go to the board and actually get the board on track and say like, this cybersecurity needs to be a priority. And I think it's the same logic for like governments, you know, governments should prioritize it as a political government, let's say state strategy. So yeah, just adding to the point on, on responsibility. Kendrick, do you want to elaborate on that, you know, that top down approach, the need for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of responsibility, I, I my lens delineates between responsibility and accountability. Yeah. So if you are the leadership in the organization, we're talking top down, if you're in the C-suite, if you are on the board, there's a measure of accountability there. And let's face it, cyber security costs money. And that funding has to be allocated from somewhere. And it's difficult within the public sector because, I mean, if you're a representative, you have to justify to your constituents why you need to spend money on cyber versus fixing roads and putting in parks for the kids to play in. So there's some challenges there. But that's the that's the accountability side. I know that in the states, uh, you know, I, I can't remember the state specifically, but I think they tried to pass a bill to make business leadership accountable in the wake of a breach in terms of potential criminal prosecution. So there's a definite finger being pointed there from an accountability perspective. But in terms of responsibility, let's face it, we all have a digital footprint and we yeah. all need to be responsible for that. Um, you know, <clears throat> strong passwords, uh, proper care and control of devices. Uh, Norton Semantic does a great survey every year on cybersecurity globally. They break it down statistically by country. And there's definite trends in terms of uh, demographics and age groups and, 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 and different things like that in terms of victimization. But I, I believe it doesn't matter if you're, you sit on the board or if you're part of the C-suite or you, you know, empty the trash at five o'clock at, at the end of the day when everyone goes home, you are all responsible. You know, if we look, if we take a cyber risk perspective in terms of system susceptibility, threat, uh, threat accessibility, which is, I guess, the crossroads of the physical security space and the cyber security space and the threat capability. You know, the third one, we generally have very little control over because the, the, the threat actors are very capable, they're very motivated, they're highly funded, they're highly skilled. We all, we all know that. Um, but from a threat accessibility perspective, that, that really makes everyone responsible. So if you're holding the keys to the kingdom in terms of digital credentials or a physical key to lock the door at the end of the day, we're all responsible. Boris, I think I could say comfortably, you've trained what thousands of Latin American military officers over your 30 years of service, right? Is the, the, the militaries in the region willing to take this role on? Because it's not, it, it's not a win, winning role, right? You're going to get breached. It's not, you know, oh, we can prevent a breach from happening. You're going to get breached, right? So is the military, as arguably the most respected institution in all of Latin America and the Caribbean within their states, are they willing to take this role on? And what kind of uh, sense are you getting from the region from the time you talk to them? 
Well, I, I, I the, uh, the first problem I see is understanding. Lack of understanding of complexity in cyberspace for the entire society. One thing is by sure that cybersecurity affect the individual, family, community, society, and the country as a whole. Inside that, the military institution, cyber required to think out of the box. That means the military, we cannot see the military as we see it in the physical domain. And that happened in Latin America at the beginning, and it's still there that, okay, cyber defense, let's give it cyber defense to the military. You do that because you don't understand the problem. Because cybersecurity, when someone thinks is going to resolve the problem of cybersecurity with technology, the people have two problems. One, they don't understand technology. And second, they don't understand security and defense. Because cyber is a different domain with different nature. It's the only domain created by humans. That means that domain change so fast. GPT-3 came up public in November. GPT-4 came up in two weeks ago public. Look, in three or four months, we changed that technology evolved from three to four is a major evolving in that technology. And then if you don't have the real understanding, what I mentioned before, converging, <clears throat> the accelerated exponential technology, you will not be able to do anything. Looking back to your question, what the military can do? Well, they need to protect themselves first. And they need to understand they will not be able to defend the nation as a whole in cybersecurity because it's a responsibility of everyone. And everyone started with the individual need to be involved in this. And the only way you can do it is educating the people, changing its education system, which is analog to digital because the new generation they are mentally digital. And that's the problem that I see. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Marty, in a little bit, but I want to get a few questions. I see some folks standing. Uh, so we'll start with this gentleman here. I do ask that uh, you keep the statement short, questions direct, uh, and please identify yourself and your affiliation. Please. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Noah Hershkowitz. I'm an intelligence analyst uh, down at AppSouth. My question is, with the with the incredible speed in which you know AI and machine learning and everything is growing for in in hopes of good use, do you guys think that this is all going too fast and technical safeguards are not being not being implemented to prevent misuse, or should the safeguards be, as was said earlier, like better education, better training against with, with the people? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Robin. All right, Tom. Hi, uh, Robbie Ferdin, uh, research coordinator at JGI. So I have two questions from the chat. The first one will be taking into consideration AI platforms like Perplexity AI and ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. What are the immediate or greatest cybersecurity implications you see forming as a result? And the second one will be what role is the US private sector having in Latin America to advance cybersecurity? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will take one more if we can. Please. Hi, my name is Archer Amen. I'm a student here at FIU, as well as a writer with the AI News publication Last Week in AI. My question is, when talking about the need for governments to make cybersecurity a higher political priority, how do we avoid over-politicizing the issue, particularly when nations such as the U.S. often engage in Latin America's cyber conversations, not necessarily as direct engagement with the region, but as sort of a proxy battle for tech competition with other nations like China? What can be done to accurately prioritize the issue while also making sure that we're focusing on the key things at hand rather than using Latin America as a political game here? 
Thank you for your questions. Uh, Marty, I'm going to start with you on the uh, AI questions, you know, uh, and I want to add a little bit because uh, there's often this discussion that technology will solve all, right? <laughs> the latest and greatest technology, the greatest and latest software, right? So is it moving too fast to, to create those safeguards necessary uh, to protect our uh, critical infrastructure and otherwise? Right. Um, is, is it moving too fast? Um, in, in a sense, the the question doesn't matter because they are going to move this fast and they're going to move faster. Um, it, you know, it's not a question of whether we should. Um, it, it's just a question of can we? And 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 organizations, governments, institutions, military intelligence are all moving as absolutely fast as they can to you know to, to gain a strategic advantage. Um, how it's used, right? You get into the topic of ethics very quickly. But I'll kick it over and, and say, and say it's a real conversation. We can have a real conversation around ethics uh, as part of a greater conversation of human computer complementarity. Okay, and the concept of complementarity is 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 gaining real traction. It's 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 very big in you know in, in cutting edge circles. Okay, the, the you know AI is not going to take over the world anytime soon. Strong AI is not going to happen in the near future. Uh, um, what, what is the future as we define it through a complementarity lens, okay? I don't even care much for the, for the, for the term AI because really what it is, is, is I'll say it's advanced information processing and, and the ability to predict, okay? Um, from, from my lens, all right, how can we achieve desirable strategic outcomes and they range from innovation to productivity to performance, uh, you know, how can we how can we take how can we take where we are today and, and, and not just incremental improvement, but 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 leapfrog, but go 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 from X to N, okay? Uh, from zero to one to use a quote. And and the technology that's coming out today enables us this this wonderful again opportunity um, to, to to go from, from you know from X to N, okay? And that if we con if we conceptualize it through a lens of complementarity, bringing in those other relevant conversations that, that now maybe introducing a technology too soon might, might, might be a problem, right? From a digital transformation or, or it's, it's immature. Google's release of its AI and, and the obvious mistakes that it made were, you know, were a, a, a political disaster. But, but if we can take this, these new technologies coming out and from a complementarity lens, address some of the, the questions, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the topics at hand, um, awareness, understanding, the, the attacks in Costa Rica, okay? all the information was there for political leaders to, to see the problem and, and take steps long before the actual breaches occurred. That information was ignored. Okay, so it didn't create a high enough degree of resonance in the minds of decision makers, and and hence it was brushed off through decision errors, and there are about two hundred of them, um, and, and so so we have to re we have to reimagine what human computer complementarity is, utilizing the new technologies like 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 you know, the, 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 you know uh, a natural language processing box like chat GPT and the various various versions of it. But can we take these and utilize them in a way that's going to create higher resonance, that's going to help move, that's going to help move uh, the conversations that we need to have from ancillary to primary and primary considerations. And of course, disasters like this unfortunately help do that. Can we do that in a in a in a better ethical good way? Thank you, Kendrick. Again, you're welcome to answer any of the questions, but I, I want to throw out you know get your thoughts on the technical uh, support, technical platforms, technical safeguards that often exist within AI integrated systems, but also really the role of the private sector and governments. You know, uh, there's there's certainly a fine balance of including the private sector because they support a lot of the critical infrastructure protections, but also they or the creators of technology in many cases. So what, what do you say on their role as well? In terms of, so it goes back to my earlier quote in terms of collaboration and coordination. Uh, law enforcement can't do it on their own. The military can't do it on their own. Um, certainly uh, less funded public sector organizations can't do it on their own. It's definitely a collaborative 
a collaborative effort. Um, I just want to speak briefly before I continue to the point of uh, the ethics and control around around AI. Uh, you know, getting inside of the mind of the, of the cyber criminal, and I do believe that there does need to be a measure of uh, policy around that um, because it's not here today, but it it could be here tomorrow, uh, so to, so to speak. But the reality is that cyber criminals they have no ethics. <laughs> They don't. They don't play by the, the rules that normal Western civilized society would necessarily play by, and the 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 playbook of the adversary really is in terms of targeting the most vulnerable, the uneducated, the unaware, uh, children, uh, seniors, and from and and on a macro level, uh, geographically uh, vulnerable regions. So this is why Latin America and the Caribbean regions are vulnerable because of lack of awareness, because of lack of policy, because of lack of education. Now, uh, the private sector, absolutely, they need to be involved. Um, I think a great model is what they're doing in the Netherlands, where you look at a public sector, private sector mix within the, 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 the federal cyber uh, teams that's, that's out there. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a solid mix of 50-50 between uh, civilian and, and sworn investigators. Um, I, you know, in some of my own cases, I've been able, able to make a tremendous amount of progress where uh, private sector organizations have come to the table with intelligence that they have the resources that we don't have uh, working as a team um, and also academia, because there's a lot of young, eager, very uh, talented minds out there that, 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 that can contribute. So again, it speaks to the collaboration effort that is required to move the needle on cyber. Fantastic. Uh, Boris, you want to follow up on that? Yes, I, I'd like to follow in this. I think the major challenge is, remember, government or public sector work on the uh, common uh, security. But the private sector is based on profit. How you are going to reconcile profit con with common security for all people? But also remember, in the private sector, they have more than 90% of what happened in cyberspace. They need to share responsibility and take responsibility. This is not easy to do because you never will be resilient in cyber if you don't have a good coordination, public and private. But they need to have better understanding, public good with profit. It's doable, but they need to work on it. Thank you. Uh, and Luis, I want to get your thoughts here, right? Because you, 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 I think every international cyber forum that I've seen, you've been at speaking, right? Whether it's the UN or GFCE or otherwise, right? This question of government and governments collaborating uh, and supporting regions, but also can they be over-politicized, right? Mm -hmm. uh, lack of adoption of international norms, for example, right? So what are your thoughts on kind of the international government governance uh, methodology and discussions going on to support regions like Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many layers to that con to that yeah. kind of like government to government relationship, right? I think there's some interesting cases of um, of the region looking at other regions, uh, both as an inspiration but also for cooperation. So uh, last year, for example, um, the Dominican Republic signed an agreement with the EU to launch uh, a new center over there for to facilitate dialogues around cybersecurity and training, uh, which is called LAC4. So that is an interesting development in the region. Um, there are multiple MOUs. So Brazil signed an MOU with the UK um, last year as well, the end of the year, to kind of boost cybersecurity cooperation. Um, so I think it's about putting the pins in place uh, for those bilateral discussions to kind of um, evolve. Um, of course, I think going to the point that was raised by by one of the researchers in the room, uh, talking about you know how do we not over politicize all of this discussion, right? I think there are lots of interests, um, and especially at the international level when we're looking at norms for responsible state behavior, right? Countries in Latin America have not, um, how can I say? There's there's this 
One of the confidence building measures in the process of discussing norms for responsible state behavior is for those member states to publish their views on how international law applies to cyberspace, right? Um, so what is sovereignty? How does the principle of sovereignty or due diligence apply in those cases? The only country in Latin America that has publicly that has published their views on how the international law applies to cyberspace is Brazil. Um, but aside from that, the OAS has been hosting conversations within the Inter-American Judicial Committee to think and to see what are the views of member states. And it's still very incipient, either because of lack of political will, either because of very, can, let's say, mundane challenges of who's actually representing and if there's a good discussion between capital and like the representative of, over at the Inter-American Judicial Committee, or even there's the question of, you know, know, this is, you know, we, we just don't want to discuss this right now. Um, and there has been a quite of a struggle to get Latin American countries views around these topics, right. And I think for a certain degree, it's understandable given the priorities in the region, but it's not sustainable. I think it's not sustainable at the international level. It's not sustainable at the regional level, right. And I think the countries in the region need a political high level dialogue to actually have a more clear agenda so that they can have better cooperation agendas so that they can have a clear conversation about, you know, what are the priorities for the region. Um, and I just wanted to touch really quickly on the point of, of the private sector, just really quickly. Um, I think on that point, you know, Countries in Latin America, I think it's 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 great, you know, other countries doing public-private cooperation, but I think there are also mundane aspects of contracting agreements and how it is so hard sometimes for these countries to actually have access to those um, services. And let's be clear, most of the cybersecurity resources from the region, I mean, they're outsourced. They're looking at the big companies, Mandiant, Microsoft, AWS. I mean, those are the ones that they're looking for. Uh, but I think there needs to also be a discussion on sustainability in terms of cooperation models between the public and private sector, where specifically on threat intelligence, I mean, even though these companies have good telemetry and they have, you know, they are the big market leaders and that's fine. There should be a conversation between, you know, bespoke threat intel companies in the region that have more of the contextual understanding and presence and how that matches together with bigger companies that might have more data, right? So that they can come together and also work with government on like filling the different gaps because it's not enough to have data. It's not enough to have just the solutions. It's important to have that strategic interpretation. And I think that's where government and private sector come together. And that also requires, you know, other companies perhaps that are working more within the country and know more of the legislative because these big companies don't always have representatives in all the countries in the region right so I think there is something of you know what kinds of models do we design for Latin America given that you know these these big companies to create a sustainable kind of conversation around cybersecurity so uh, I'm going to go to this gentleman right here very quick and if you can direct your question to one of our speakers uh, and your final one so no pressure well, I, I cannot direct my question, but uh, but still, I will ask it. Okay. Um, so, some of I'm Ricardo Smith. I come from Mexico. I work at a consulting firm that advises some firms on tech-related issues, among others. But um, it's very interesting because in Mexico right now, last week, a congressman he introduced a very highly expected bill on cybersecurity. Um, everyone's talking about cyber in Mexico right now. And some of the issues that you're mentioning are playing out in the national context. However, um, uh, they, they, have, uh, they have centralized power on the military, on the National Guard, which right now is being highly criticized because of human rights issues. So how can we mix all this uh, need to address cyber threats with also uh, concerns about human rights, about uh, military civic relations. Thank you for that question. And fortunately, Boris and I were talking about this yesterday. So I'm going to throw Boris the final response uh, to the gentleman's question. Well, I, I think the case of Mexico is very important. Remember, Mexico lost six terabytes of information, right? And then this is every, every single day. But the, in the case of Mexico, is the lack of continuity. Because the previous government of Mr. Obrador over there in Mexico, the country was doing a good step ahead at the level of policy and strategy, working very hard with the private sector also. What happened is when the new government came, priority for cybersecurity was not there. And it's still not there. And this is a major get back to Mexico. And you know what happened is, it's two things. 
First, when you don't have political will, and the second one, because the technology got so fast, and yet you have two things that put the, the country behind. And what those advances made by Mexico before this administration in Mexico, it was good. But now they are not in that position back in 2017. No, they are even further back because it's two things. The government didn't pay attention to that. And the second thing, technology in the last four years had advanced and has been accelerated so fast. That means for the new administration is major challenge. And I, we need to see how the new administration and the election process show us any priority in cyber. Thank you for that. And please join me in a round of applause for our fantastic panelists. I'm gonna turn it uh, back over to my colleague, Lisa and Lazarus, uh, to take us over to the remain seating for now. And that, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for an incredible, incredible panel. Um, Randy, thank you so much.